Case number C-17-135, Ali v. Trump. Council, please make your appearances for the record. Matt Adams with Northwest Immigrant Rights Project on behalf of the plaintiffs. Thank you. Mary Kenny with the American Immigration Council, also here with Melissa Crow and Aaron Reichlin Melnick from the American Immigration Council. For go the ahead, Council. Council, you can go ahead and finish. Thank you. Any other counsel on behalf of the plaintiffs? This is Trina Real Muto and Kristen McLeod Ball from the National Immigration Project, the National Lawyers Guild, on behalf of plaintiffs. Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Chad Radler on behalf of the United States. Radler. Stacy Young on behalf of the United States. Thank you. Counsel, we are here in connection with the. Um, what was styled as an emergency motion for temporary restraining order and preliminary injunction. Uh, there is no such thing as emergency motions anymore, um, but we seem to get a number of them. Um, I think the best way to do this uh, is that I'm going to ask the plaintiffs to take the lectern first, and I have a series of questions uh, that I'd like to explore with them. <clears throat> then I'm going to do the same thing with the government. Uh, and at the conclusion of all of that, I will give you 10 minutes uh, each to do what you thought you were probably going to take an hour to do here today. Uh, so that will be our, our procedure for today. Mr. Adams, are you speaking on behalf of the plaintiffs? I am. Thank you. All right. You, um, I'm going to try and, and, and paraphrase some of the uh, arguments made by the or the defendants, and ask for your response to them. Um, and the first is reading the the simple language of uh, 8 U.S.C. 1182F. It reads, whenever the president finds that the entry of any aliens or any class of aliens into the United States would be detrimental to the interests of the United States, he may by proclamation and for such period as he deems necessary suspend the entry of all aliens or any class of aliens as immigrants or non-immigrants or impose on the entry of aliens any restrictions he may deem to be appropriate. I, I guess I can't do left hand and right hand since that's not very meaningful, but that's one side of this argument. Uh, the other side of the argument is 8 U.S.C. 1152A1A, uh, which reads, except as specifically provided in paragraph 2, and in sections 1101A27, 1151B2A, small i, and in 1153 of this title, no person shall receive any preference or priority or be discriminated against in the issuance of an immigrant visa because of the person's race sex, nationality, place of birth, or place of residence. You all know that language well, but the audience now, I think, perhaps has a better idea of what I'm going to ask you next. It is the government's argument that um, the operative language I should concentrate on in 1182 is for such period as he shall deem necessary, suspend the entry and I'm going to highlight the word entry, of all aliens or any class of aliens. Your briefing makes clear that what you think is of greater importance uh, is this question of preference or priority or be discriminated against in the issuance of an immigrant visa. So let's start with the question, isn't there a difference between entry of all aliens and the issuance of an immigrant visa? <clears throat> 
There is, and I think it makes actually an important point in that <coughs> the executive order that the government has now promulgated as of March 6 does not even attempt to focus on entry. Instead, it purports to say that everyone who has been issued a visa will be permitted to enter. And in a sense, they backed away from any purported ban to entries and have focused their efforts on the legal process for issuing visas. So if there, to the extent that there's a distinction, which there is, between issuing visas and entries, that only supports plaintiff's case because this new executive order attempts to undermine the precise area that Congress has said it may not do that, that is, as far as discriminating in the issuance of visas. It seems to me that, that you're making an assumption in there, which is that um, a holder of a visa would have an automatic right to enter the country, whereas the government argues that 1182 vests the president with the authority to, um, I don't want to quote the language here, suspend the entry of all aliens, all aliens, or any class of aliens, as he deems appropriate. Why can't someone have a visa but not have a right to enter under the authority of 1182? If I may make a more um, discreet point before I go on to the broader picture, and that, with respect to that question, is that defendants throughout their briefing have tried to reframe plaintiff's argument. We have never argued that our plaintiffs are entitled to admission, that they're entitled to an issuance of the visas, only that they're entitled to have those visas issued in accordance with the law. And to the extent defendants now intend to impose this new system, discriminating on the base of national origin and religion, that it is in violation of the Constitution and the statute. And so they don't have the authority to go there. And that, that leads me into the, the second point, is that while undoubtedly 1182F provides broad authority to the president in many aspects, Congress subsequently was crystal clear that as to the issuance of immigrant visas, there is no authority to discriminate on the basis of national origin or country of birth, just as there's no authority to discriminate on the basis of race. If, if defendant's argument were accepted, it would equally require this court to accept that President Trump could declare that any non-Caucasian is temporarily suspended from being permitted to enter this country. And, and yes, that person could be permitted, the person of color could be permitted to then go seek a visa, but that the president has unfettered authority to temporarily or indefinitely bar the suspension of, of any individual that he so chooses, so long as he does it in the name of national security. Well, let's, let's try and concentrate your argument. I haven't seen you argue on race, sex, place of birth, place of residence. You, you stressed nationality because the, the ban or the executive order that's proposed in front of me deals with countries on a, on a list saying they, they have, you know, they're not going to be able to enter the United States. So let, let's stay centered on nationality. That is not a black and white question under the law. I mean, it says, the, I'm not sure where this language comes from, but you know, on the verge of war, uh, national emergencies, um, various situations where uh, nationality has, has been allowed to be uh, used as a criteria. There are various situations, and again, uh, I would say defendants attempt to reframe our argument and say that we're arguing that there can be no distinctions made based on nationalities, which is not what we have asserted. Mm -hmm. Rather that the statute specific to the immigrant, the issuance of immigrant visas precludes the government from discriminating on the base of national origin or country of birth. So in other context, yes, with the visa waiver program where they allow some people to show up at the airport without ever even applying for a visa in order to visit us for 90 days, they have the authority to make distinctions between countries. But with respect to the issuance of immigrant, that is permanent visas, they do not have that authority. And of course, that ties directly into our immigration history. Why was Congress so specific about that? And that's because the very first immigration laws we had 
was the original iteration of the Chinese Exclusion Act, which extended through the national origin quota system. So for the next 80 years, we had laws that were focused on excluding individuals on the basis of their national origin, on the basis of the country of birth. And so Congress didn't just get rid of that system. They also included the non-discrimination clause. Well, let me see if I can put words in your mouth, the favorite habit of mine. What I hear you saying then is that as long as the government does not discriminate in the issuance of immigrant visas, it is free to ban the entry of aliens or any class of aliens by presidential authority. No, I, I definitely do not make that assertion. Instead, I say that while the, while the president has more authority outside of the context of immigrant visas, it is very clear within the processing of, uh, and issuing of immigrant visas that he may not uh, make that distinction among countries. So there's other limits that are placed upon the president outside of the context of immigrant visas and also that are controlling an immigrant visas and that's the constitutional protections that we've talked about in our brief equal protection under the law and the establishment clause and the president of course is bound by those constitutional limits as well but within the context of immigrant visas he is furthermore bound by the immigration and nationality act and it's explicit um, bar to any discrimination and, and I would note that that bar itself contains exceptions. It contains three exceptions. But each one of those exceptions is enumerated in a statute. And if indeed 1182F were an exception, that would similarly be referred to. But it did not. And I think that is very plain from the, not only the, uh, the history of the Immigration Nationality Act, a history from the, legisl the, the le legislative history which talks about or rather demonstrates Congress imposing limits on the discretion of the administration to issue visas and their concern that the executive branch would continue to endorse this idea of Western Europeans uh, being privileged and receiving priority in issuing visas. So Congress was very clear to limit that. And, and earlier, if I may, you said, I'm, I'm straying a little on focus in, in making reference to race and, and gender. And, and that is true. That's not what's precisely before this court. But I think it's very important to acknowledge that the non-discrimination clause also talks about, um, for example, gender, that uh, sex, that an individual cannot be discriminated on the basis of sex. This was not part of the prior uh, Immigration Act. So why did Congress include that in here? The government's argued that we should just ignore, as it were, the plain language of, of the 1152A1 and, and interpret that to mean, well, that all Congress sought to do was clarify that they're moving away from the na national origins quota system. But if that indeed was their purpose, then why did they also include sex as another unlawful basis on which, um, which is the, the executive branch is unable to discriminate? Well, the irony is not lost on the court that both of you urged the same thing, which was for me to enforce the plain language of the two rival provisions. And, and I would say, fortunately for plaintiffs, that's why we have rules of statutory construction. And one of the primary cardinal rules is that the specific takes precedent over the more general rule. And so 1182F talks about, in general, the president's authority in dealing with entry and, and, and national security. But then you have the non-discrimination clause, which is specific to the immigrant visa process and makes specific statutory references to the exceptions that it will permit. And that rule, again, further demonstrates what we argue is the plain language of the statute. Similarly, the cardinal rule of statutory construction that you look at the subsequently enacted statute to shed light. And here we have, um, well, 10 years after the enactment of 1182F, the non-discrimination provision being introduced by Congress. Well, the irony in that is both of you do the same thing for this. You urge me to enforce the plain language of statutory construction and reach 180 degree opposite conclusions as to what it means. And unfortunately, that's often the plight we're left in when we're talking about what the government is seeking to do. All right, let's talk about irreparable harm. Um, 
I, I'm periodically lost um, in some of your briefing on the question of how the uh, plaintiff's harm, which we, we've talked about previously, is tied to Executive Order 2. Help me with that one. As of tomorrow, absent intervention from the court, any individual who's in the queue for immigrant visa processing from one of these six countries, targeted countries, will have their applications placed on hold. Where, well, now, where do you get that? Um, give the, the and that's directly contrary to something that the government says in its brief. The, the government has, has noted that the interviews that have already been scheduled that they'll move forward with those interviews. And if someone is approved at one of those interviews that have already been scheduled, then they will have the opportunity to get a visa on which they'll enter. But for every individual who does not have an interview, or as our plaintiffs, for example, Mr. Omar's children went to their interview two days ago, and as named plaintiffs, they showed up in the consulate in Kenya, in Nairobi, and at the interview, the officer said, well, you know what, now we want DNA tests. We want to prove, even though that visa petition has been approved, go back and get DNA tests to prove that Mr. Omar really is your father. And so now our clients are going to need to get those DNA tests and, and turn them back in. But once they've turned those back in, we're now going to be within the period of the suspension. And so their cases will be placed on ice. And now the government seeks to minimize the harm, calling this a minimum delay. Um, I think any parent of a small child would vehemently protest that any period of furthering separation from their child doesn't constitute irreparable harm. But that is much more the case for many of our clients where the government themselves acknowledge they come from countries that are covered by active conflict zones. And every day that our client separation is extended is irreparable harm in the form of emotional trauma and indeed may result in trauma to the physical well-being of our clients. Well, there's a distinction, it seems to me, between extended because it's extended and extended because of the executive order. What, where in the record is it's extended because of the executive order? The executive order, um, and if you'll give me the order, I'll, the executive order says that as of March 16th, there's a 90-day suspension for issuing visas. Now, one thing I would note, and I think this is critical also, even though we would, we would strongly dispute that 90 days in and of itself is not enough to demonstrate irreparable harm, in the executive order, there is no automatic mechanism that the 90 days will end. At, at the end of 90 days, this suspension is, is automatically lifted. To the contrary, the order purports to lay down a series of terms that must be met, terms that by their very nature with these six targeted governments have almost no possibility of being met in any foreseeable future. And this contrasts with the, the refugee suspension provision because in the executive order, after 120 days, the refugee suspension order is automatically lifted. That is not the case with immigrant visa processing. Well, I, if my recollection of immigration law is that the president has that authority, he can change at any time um, the procedures related to, to issuance of visas, unless you know, I accept your premise that it's it's motivated by an improper purpose. The the president is confined not just by the Immigration Nationality Act, but also the Constitution, and so right now we're focused on. Section 1182F and its interplay with 1152A1. And 1152A1 says the president has no role in, in modifying eligibility for the issuance of visas based upon national origin or country of birth. The, the, the government in their brief asserts that there's no room for the court to overlook the lawful exercise of discretion of the president. But again, that's, pre, that's assuming, that presupposes that what the president is doing is lawful. The president has absolutely no discretion to violate the law, whether that's the Immigration Nationality Act or the Constitution. Um, again, with irreparable harm. Well, let, let's, you're, you're in a slip-off point okay. here. Uh, 
you you've got the government makes the argument just flat out that, that there is no one there right now who isn't involved in a process which will continue forward and what is your best response to that the declaration that they themselves submit contradicts their argument in their in their declaration are you going to have to identify which declaration and where thank you they submitted as an exhibit which is docket 71 1 a um, declaration from an officer from uh, the United States Department of State and it purports to go through uh, the current status of the named plaintiffs and in that declaration it states that the first so I'm going down to paragraph 3 of 71 1 and it says the first uh, plaintiff listed there which is uh, AFA the seven-year-old child of uh, Ms. Ali says the case is current awaiting submission of documents to the National Visa Center by the petitioner and applicant well one that's wrong we've submitted a, a declaration today with um, with the supporting exhibit showing that all the documents were submitted back in January so there, there's nothing that there that's pending there other than waiting to be scheduled for an interview that's a current visa priority date this child would be reunited with his mother but for a visa appointment of course unless there's some determination of inadmissibility that's made during that interview um, I would then skip down to the third bullet point under paragraph three yes, there, I, if you would care to pronounce that first name for me uh, no but I'll pronounce the last <laughs> name uh, Ms. Hamadani there is the beneficiary of the approved immigrant visa petition with a current priority date to so the priority date of April 14 2015 the final sentence the CCD reflects that the case is current at NVC National Visa Center and is in the queue for visa application interview scheduling so again there's a prima facie case ready to go but for the suspension this person would be being set up for an interview and being reunited with her spouse and again that's the same with the seven-year-old child AFA and now let's go to the middle prong there um, this is a prong where it says uh, G he's a 16 year old boy of, of, of Ms. Daman who's currently stranded in Syria is the beneficiary of approved immigrant visa now here they say his priority date is not yet current there's actually two sets of priority dates one priority date where the applicant is then informed you can now uh, pay your fees and file your applications he has done that he's paid all fees submitted all applications and then the next priority date is where he's in the queue so he's stuck there until the ones ahead of him are processed so the fact that the individuals whose current uh, priority dates are current are not now being processed means that this 16 year old boy is going to have to wait even longer because we don't get to his turn until they process the ones who are ahead of him and then finally turning to paragraph four and that's the uh, reference that I made to the client today Mr. Omar who's here with us today his three children had their interviews scheduled on Monday again their visa uh, date was current they've had two different uh, interviews scheduled uh, canceled and rescheduled but they showed up and then they told the children well you need more now we want a DNA test and for the child that's now turned 19 we want a police certificate to show that she has not got a criminal record behind so they've asked for more evidence that's fine they have the authority to ask for more evidence if they want to but what they do not have the authority to do is to now place her application on hold and further the time period that's going to take for it to be resolved based upon those children's national origin or country of birth so we have plaintiffs that are able to present as of tomorrow if this is given effect uh, imminent irreparable harm because this is going to directly impact their cases it's going to extend the time periods that they're separated from their spouse or, or their parents all right um, council I think that's let me look at my notes so your understanding is the visa processing or adjudication for the listed countries is stopped under EO2 that is correct and, and what's your authority for that because what the it's the executive order itself that it makes reference to what processes will continue those individuals it says 
who have been issued a visa, who have already been scheduled an interview in that time period, will move forward with their interview. But after that point, there's a 90-day suspension. But in a 90 days without a mechanism that's going to restart that process. Would you read me that language? I will. Um, if, I, if I may sit down and come back up and... and well, I'd like you to do it now because okay. I don't think you're right. All righty. So let's look at both okay, one look at aspect... Section 2C of the sec proposed... Or 2C. If I may start with 1F and then go to 2C. Um, because 1F is the first place in the order where it specifies the suspension of, um, of uh, processing. So um, going to the last sentence of 1F, accordingly, while that assessment is ongoing, I am imposing a temporary pause on the entry of nationals from Iran, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen, subject to the categorical exceptions and case-by-case -case waivers as described in Section 3 of this order. Didn't I hear you just say entry? That's right. So we start off talking about, about entry. And, and that's different than what you've just told me. Um, yes, I, it is all true. Right. That well, then, then let's move on to your yeah. second point because okay. I want to take all your time here. Th very well. 2C, um, to temporarily reduce investigative burdens, and then moving on down to um, halfway through that paragraph, I hereby again proclaim, pursuant to Section 212F and 215A of the INA, and the, the section stayed there, that un, the unrestricted entry into the United States of nationals of Iran, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen would be detrimental to the interests of the United States. I therefore direct that entry into the United States and nationals of those six countries be suspended for 90 days from the effective date of this order subject to the limitations, waivers, and exceptions. So again, I, I acknowledge it's going to your point, it's focusing on entry. Well, it, it goes beyond that. Isn't that really rather misleading when you announce that it's a freeze on processing when there, the literal language of the executive order says entry? I mean, you, you do this for a living and you know a lot more than me, but you've come in here and demonstrated great knowledge that there's a huge difference between those two things. And now you're conflating them suddenly because it benefits your client's position. Well. If I may, um, later on it talks about visa issuance, but it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't benefit my client's uh, position to say, even if the order on its face just said entry and not visa issuance, that's still going to affect my clients and cause further delay. Later on in, in the executive order, it talks about how the, the interviews that are currently scheduled will be allowed to go forward. Well, I'm going to make the government's argument for it because that's okay. where we started and this is where we end. 1182F says entry of all aliens. And the, the provision you're championing, 1152, says issuance of immigrant visas. It, it, it's very hard for me to, to not notice that those are two different things. Um, I, 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 yes. I mean, but the entry process, when you're putting a categorical hold on the entry process, and when the, the process, later on when it talks about waivers that will be available, it explicitly states that's part of the visa issuance process. So if it was only focused on entry, it would make no sense for the, the executive order to say, well, we're going to provide some exceptions, we're, we're going to provide some waivers, and those waivers are going to be administered at the time of the visa issuance. And so I, I acknowledge that, that I'm completing the language, but I'm doing that in accordance with what happens both pr as a practical matter and what's also taking place in the executive order. All right. Thank you, sir. Reader. I will continue to read that E out of your last name because I understand it's, that's how you pronounce it. Uh, Ray, Raidler, Your Honor, but, uh, it, but whatever you use is certainly fine. Uh, you may begin, sir. Thank you, Your Honor, and may it please the court. American presidents enjoy both statutory and constitutional power to regulate immigration and national security, including to make determinations based upon nationality to further those foreign policy judgments. Presidents have repeatedly invoked that authority, 
from President Carter's restriction on immigration by certain Iranians to President Reagan's restrictions on Cuban immigration to President Clinton's restrictions on certain Sudanese immigrants. In consultation with the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Homeland Security, and the Attorney General, President Trump signed into law on March 6th an executive order to protect the nation from foreign terrorist entry into the United States. Let, let's, let's get you off your speech here. You, you've just stated the premise that the President is free to discriminate based on national origin. How do you reconcile that with 1152? That's a, that's a good question, Your Honor, and I'm, I'm, I appreciate that you started there because it does highlight 1182F, which of course is plenary power to the President, has long been recognized to deny the entry of any alien or any class of aliens. That has long been recognized as exhaustive power uh, for the President to put limits uh, on any alien group uh, coming into the United States. 1152A is a very narrow provision. Uh, for one thing, it applies only to visas, not to entry. Uh, for another thing, it only applies to immigrant visas. And it was done, as my, my friend on the other side noted, in response to an issue where there was a quota system that was being used and the United States wanted to replace that with more of a percentage system. There was a very narrow attention to a very specific issue in the immigration process. Well, but the and language of the law is the language of the law. There, there's, I understand that that's your position on what the legislative history is, but as my late colleague uh, Justice uh, Scalia was fond of remarking, you can read those legislative histories for anything you want it. The, the facts underneath that are, are certainly not as narrow as, as you. It had to do with what visa or what location you had to go to in order to obtain a visa interview. So let's, you know, spare me that one. Just let's look at the language of the statute as we're directed to do and explain to me why it doesn't cover Issuance of immigrant visa, your point, is banned if it's based on nationality. The words that's, that's there. And, and in your language, to me, it's, you know, judge, do the simple thing. Read the language and apply it. That, that language replies with respect to consular officials reviewing visa applications. The president is treated differently under the statute. Congress has made that clear. Where? 1182F is exactly where your honor started. The president has, has uh, complete authority over limitations on entry into the United States. Uh, and the President, so for example, in this executive order. Well, you, now you're, you're doing what Mr. Adams did. You, you're jumping back and forth and equating entry and visa. Is, is that your position that those are synonymous terms? Or I, in the, I didn't sense it would be identical terms? The, 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 the entry uh, requirement is uh, a requirement that encompasses a number of aspects. I mean, there are a number of things that you need to do to be able to enter the country. One of those is you need to submit initial documentation. Another one of those you need, is that you need a visa to travel to the country. Another one of those is that when you come to the, come to the country, you seek to formally enter the country. At any, one of those, at any one of those places, you can be stopped from entering the country. And the President has complete authority over the entire process of entry into the United States. The visa process is one aspect of the entire entry process. Well, if I accept the rule of construction that the specific controls over the general, I have to reject your argument because I've got a specific thing that says issuance of an immigrant visa can't be based on nationality. Well, and and in, in response, you say, yeah, but he has broad power on entry. And by the way, part of entry is issuance of the visa. Under, uh, you've argued contrary to this in your briefing. I frankly find that kind of remarkable because it violates every statutory construction rule, including the ones that you cited to me, which is the specific governs the general. Well, Your, Your Honor, again, the, another rule of statutory construction is that we, we interpret statutes by the statutory company they keep. The scheme has to be read uh, in total. And 1182F has always been read as a catch-all provision to allow presidents to do exactly what President Trump here did, but what presidents throughout history have done over time. And in fact, the entire immigration process is based upon country to specific determinations. For example, the visa waiver program. We have special relationships with certain countries where we don't require uh, visitors from those countries to have any kind of visa at all. We have a special agreement with Canada and Mexico through NAFTA that governs how they enter the country. There are a host of other countries where we have country specific, nationality based. Uh, agreements, restrictions, requirements for entry into the country. There's a long history of that, and when you read the statutes in total, when you read all the statutes together, it's clear the President has that power, 
and has long had that power. And it also flows from one other place, Section 1185 uh, of, of the INA, which also gives the power, uh, the President the power to place limits and exceptions on the entry and uh, departure of uh, aliens from the country. Well, let, let's stay on statutory construction for a moment here. What I was taught was that when you have a, a subsequently adopted provision, the legislature is deemed, deemed to have knowledge of the existing structure of the law. If they had wanted to accomplish what you're saying, then why would the Congress not have put in 1152 something saying, and exempted from this broad prohibition against discrimination is 11, uh, or excuse me, 1182F. But Your Honor, there was, again, there, there was no reason to because they weren't looking to restrict the power of the President in this section. Uh, this is a, a very narrow aspect of the entire entry process. Again, this just goes to immigrant visas and the requirement for Im immigrant visas. And you just told me that that was one third of this process. That's, that's correct. And, you, and in fact, it's the one you got to start where well, you got to apply, but you, you, don't, you don't go anywhere without an, an immigrant visa. That's, and that's, so, that's, I mean, now you're minimizing the issuance of this immigrant visa. Oh, it's a small part of this process. It, it's not a small part of the process. Well, again, the statutory amendment was meant to address one specific issue with respect to quota issues uh, with respect to immigrant visas. Where, and where it, does it say that? That's, that's the legislative history upon which the statute was granted. But the statute says specifically it applies only to immigrant visas. So to read that, again, with a broader statutory scheme to say that plays some kind of restriction on the President's broader power to limit entry into the United States would be assuming that Congress meant to override this power, this broad power, and never said so, and that no court has ever acknowledged this argument. There's no case that actually holds what the other side is arguing. And there's a long history of the President doing exactly what President Trump did here. And let me just talk about the executive order for a minute. Well, before you leave that one, uh, no case has ever held that? You, you cite in your own brief, legal assistance for Vietnamese asylum seekers versus Department of State. And then you attempt to distinguish it by saying, oh, that was the State Department, that wasn't the President. That, that, that case, if I'm remembering it right, the Lavis case, uh, didn't, didn't address Section 1182F. I don't think that case was about 1182F, if I'm thinking of the same case. Issuance of non-immigrant visas by individual counselor officers. Uh, correct. That was a, that was a distinct. That was a determination by. I, if I'm thinking of the right case. That was a determination about an individual consular official and whether they had, had whether they had violated some aspect of the uh, of the INA. Well, but it didn't. It didn't what, you, what you said about that case, and we're talking about legal assistance. Plaintiffs cite one decision addressing nationality-based distinctions in another immigration context, which did not involve an exercise of the president's authority under Section 1182F or 1185A. And, and what I'm saying is if you read that case, it seems to me to have a lot more validity to it than, than you seem to allege. But my reading of the case, Your Honor, I don't think that case said anything at all about 1182F. It was about an individual consular decision with respect to ap application of the statute. And uh, there was some discussion about national origin versus nationality, and there may have been, may have been some confusion about how those terms are used. But the case did not go at all to the question of whether 1182F placed, did, did, there's any limits on that power the President has. I don't think there's a case that holds that there's a limit on the President's power. That was the point I was making. And well, let, let's talk about that. I mean, this is where you got in trouble on Executive Order 1, Correct. more with the circuit than with me. <laughs> uh, are, are you back to this notion that anything the President does in the immigration area is, is basically unreviewable in the court system? Well, that's an important question, Your Honor. I think there's two aspects to that. The, the court, there's no history of the courts looking behind a president's national security determination, a national security judgment. That's a power that's strictly reserved to the executive. Now, certainly there are constitutional uh, requirements that all presidents have to adhere to, and uh, certainly courts are uh, appropriately uh, authorized to measure any executive action against the Constitution. But with respect to a president's judgment about immigration, foreign policy, national security, and the risks, those are things that are, are routinely deferred to the executive, and there's not a history of the courts reviewing that, that aspect of the case. Well, if, if that's the case, then, then why do we have 1152A, and, and who enforces it? Because you just staked out the position that the president's free to ignore it. 
Your Honor, again, that, that provision applies to consular officials who are reviewing specific applications with respect to uh, immigrant visas. And so let me take, the, let, me, let, me, let, let me take, for example, the DIN, the DIN case, the recent case in the U.S. Supreme Court. That case talked about, again, the um, specific acts of individual consular officials reviewing an application, sort of what rights there were with respect to uh, challenging that determination. But there's no case applying that logic or that reasoning and, and the plurality there to the President of the United States. And that's because the President is judged differently for a host of reasons. One is 11A2 and 11A5. Another is the President's unique position as the Commander in Chief, uh, the Chief Executive, uh, who has ultimate authority over immigration. And Congress uh, is at its zenith when it's operating with respect to immigration and has delegated its full authority to the President. Now, with, res with respect to the executive order, one point I want to make about the executive order. In the, in the executive order, when we're talking about this, the, the visa process and the waiver process, the president the executive order did not have to. I'm sorry, whose phone is ringing? Who just turned their phone off? Is anyone going to fess up? All right, if it happens again, I'll seriously consider having everyone leave. We don't have phones that go off during court proceedings, and it costs you $50 to the charity of your choice when it does. And I would have expect people who are here to have more respect for the court and respect for the law than to leave their phone on. Please continue, Ms. Redler. No problem, Your Honor. I'd just like to make one point about the executive order and then turn to the irreparable harm and the point that the, the, Your Honor asked a number of questions about, because I think there's some, some important points there. But with respect to the executive order, the president put in place a waiver process to make sure that there were no due process concerns or other things raised that were honored by or spotted by this court and the Ninth Circuit. But the president likely had the authority with respect to people who have never been in the country and do not have a visa to not require a waiver process at all. So for the plaintiffs to say that somehow with respect to treating these countries by allowing them to have a, a waiver creates some issues is unusual to me because the president didn't have to require, didn't have to allow for the waivers. Uh, and to, be, to begin with, it could have just said people from the, those countries are barred pursuant to the president's power. And I do. That didn't fare very well last time, so. Well, uh, 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 you're, that's correct, Your Honor. It was a very different group of people. And I would like to say that the president uh, honored that decision. Uh, there was a very important decision that came from this court, that came from the Ninth Circuit. The executive order sought to very closely hew to what those courts laid out. And that's why there are so many significant changes to the, to the executive order. And those have significant legal impacts, as the court understands, with respect to due process and the scope of the order. I would like to talk about the irreparable harm issue. I think that's an issue that essentially resolves the emergency status of, of today's hearing. Well, l let me pick at this gap one more question then before you move on. I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm bleeding or... or <laughs> but. I mean, what, what I hear you saying is that basically Congress is delegated to the president and the president is free to do anything it wants. And the conclusion that I would draw from that is that if Congress passed something that specifically said, do this in immigration, your position is the president's free to say, no, you've already given me the authority. You can't have it back. You can't change anything I do and just stop bothering me. Is that really your position today? No, that's not, that's not our position, Your Honor. If there's a specific requirement with respect to the president's powers, then, of course, the president would honor that vis-a-vis -vis his, his, his constitutional authority. But again, we don't read 1152A that way for the, the reasons I've, I've listed. Uh, what we, 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 and I don't think the Congress intended it that way either. One, because they didn't say anything in terms of trying expressly to limit 11A2 or 11A5. Again, 11A5 is a broad grant of authority to the president to, to address the entry or removal of aliens. That section was amended after 1152. So even if you agree with the argument that 1152 somehow put a limitation on 1182, 1185 was amended afterwards, and the Congress kept the very broad authority there for the president as well to regulate, Im regulate immigration. So where, I think that where, solves your where, statutory interpretation question. Where, where in your brief is that argument? Uh, I I'm, I'm certain that we I'd have to go back and look at the page, but I'm certain we cite 1185, and 1185 was amended, 1185A1, I believe, was amended after uh, 1152, more recently in time. I'd be happy to write on it. Uh, That's to fine. You were moving on to irreparable injury. Uh, Your Honor, that, that, is an, that is a very important issue because there were some characterizations made by my friend on the other side about how the visa and the waiver process will work. And this is something I tried to highlight on our call earlier this week uh, that the State Department has spoken on very specifically. They issued an, uh, uh, they issued an important announcement on Monday. And I'd just like to read two or three sentences from that because I think they go directly to the issues before the court. 
We do not plan to cancel any previously scheduled visa appointments. After the new executive order goes into effect, any individual who believes he or she is eligible for a waiver or exemption should apply for a visa and disclose during the visa interview any information that might qualify the individual for a waiver exemption. A consular officer will carefully review each case to determ determine whether the applicant is affected by the executive order and if so, whether the applicant qualifies. In other words, in that sense, it is business as usual with the State Department in terms of processing materials, conducting interviews, and asking whether an applicant uh, is eligible for a waiver. So I think well, some of the arguments about the delay and the slow in the process are really not uh, consistent with the way the State Department has outlined the process. This is an important point, and you fundamentally disagree factually about it, which is why we decided to have oral argument. What I have just heard you say was it's not business as usual. It's business as usual with an asterisk, which is that you have this waiver opportunity uh, to say, well, you do something and, and really you're not recognizing my situation. That's, that seems to me would never be necessary unless you were planning on having some kind of a change in the existing, by existing I'll pick the December 31st system that was in operation. Well, the, there's obviously a, the travel pause put in place by the, by the executive order. But the waiver process addresses the plaintiffs here and people who would be like them who have close family relatives in the United States. And when you're applying for the visa, you make the showing as to why the waiver would apply. That's going to be very consistent with much of the process you're doing now because if you're coming, if the reason you're coming is that someone here is a relative who, is, who has filed uh, with the immigration authorities to have you come to the country, you'll obviously pre be presenting the information about your relationship with that person in the country and why it's a close family member and you should be entitled to enter our country under the immigration laws. So it's, it's awfully consistent with information that would be presented anyway, and now the counselor just looks to see if a waiver uh, should be granted. And I, I think it's also important to keep in mind that this is a very long process, generally speaking, and it's been a very long process for my friend's clients on the other side. Uh, so, some, of, some of them, I think, applied for um, status to, to enter as far back as 2014 or maybe even before. It's been three or four years. Uh, for many of them, they're still in that process. With respect to the request that um, some family members came in and said that, th and they said that their father is here uh, in the country, the, uh, according to our um, declaration that we filed, the consular official asked for DNA evidence that's very consistent with, with the typical practice of the, of the State Department. If you go to the State Department's website, there's a whole page that talks about DNA testing. It's very important. This is a, a, a very important process, and they want to ensure that there are actually family relationships. In this, in this example, um, the client who is here, I think, has not lived in Africa for many years uh, and has spent most of the last uh, 15 or so years in the United States. And so, of course, the um, State Department just wants to verify the appropriate relationships. So that's, that's all part of the typical process. This is not a fast process. The three-month pause is unlikely to have much, if any, effect on most of the applicants. And again, many of them will, will be able to be asked to be eligible for a waiver. If they're denied at that point, they may have a ripe claim to come back to this court and say they should have some basis for additional review. But none of them under the current system even, none of them under the current system are eligible even to come to this country. Most of them have a number of steps in front of them still. So to say that there is one, an, an urgent, immediate issue that the court needs to rule on and, 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 and enjoin or restrict the enforcement of the, of the executive order I think is wrong. And two, I don't think these claims are even ripe yet because, again, I don't think we can sh we, they can show with any certainty any kind of actual effect or slowing of the process this is going to have, which is a very long process uh, with, a, with a number of steps. Well, let me ask you this because I'm still a little unclear on one aspect of this. I want you to assume that you have a visa applicant uh, who does not have an interview date. What is their status? Can they get an interview? Uh, my, my, reading, my, my reading of the State Department's uh, uh, procedures, yes, they can. Now, and so you're comfortable with my putting in the order that anyone who is a visa applicant can ask for, not obtain, but can ask for and schedule an interview? Well, I, I mean, again, with the, with the standard controlling process that operates today, uh, there obviously we have a lot of rules in place about you apply, you, you submit yeah. initial paperwork uh, to the National Visa Center, when you've submitted the proper amount of paperwork, 
you get a visa number, you're in, you're in, you're in a queue, you have an opportunity to request an inter interview at some point, but it, it's not a certain date as to when it'll happen. That finally happens, you get there for your interview, there are questions you may, as these, as these as happened to these clients, there may be additional follow-up information that's needed. My understanding is that it, it will be business as usual with respect to those procedures, and that's what I think the State Department has envisioned by, through their... <laughs> I know you're from Justice and the other side of the State Department, but I, I need to have someone speak on behalf of the United States. Are you telling me that if you don't have an interview scheduled at this time, you are still eligible to apply for an interview? and that there isn't a freeze on interviews. That, 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 that's correct, Your Honor. I will say that is my understanding based upon reading the guidance issued on this very issue by the State Department. If, if I find out that is wrong, well, I'll come back to court immediately and correct that. Uh, but my, my understanding is that is exactly how it's, how it's going to work. Right. Well, as a practical matter, then what extent does, the, we're going to call it Executive Order 2, which is, my favorite is 2.0, but that's a different question. How does that change the time frame for a person's interview as it exists right now? Uh, b based, up, based upon the uh, State Department guidance that I read, I'm not sure that it's going to have any impact. Uh, in one sense, it could, s some people may decide not to apply for, for visas, so it could actually expedite the process for certain people if there are less, less, less visas. Also, the order does expressly direct that consular officials that, uh, that uh, consular offices need to hire additional officials. That's also in the executive order, the idea to have more, to more staffing to review materials. So I don't think anyone is anticipating a slowdown. Is there a slowdown associated with the waiver process? Well, the waiver process is built into the uh, standard, standard visa process. Uh, so I, my understanding is that the same types of questions that would have been asked about, your, for example, your family relationship are still going to be asked. Uh, but, but the process has not obviously started yet. If someone is delayed significantly and wants to bring that issue to the court's attention, that might be a ripe injury. Certainly no one here at this moment has that type of injury, even if it would potentially occur later on. Well, let's talk about that. Mr. Hamamadi, I think it's pronounced, is currently in the queue for a visa interview. At least that's what I think I understood today. He is the only person plaintiff seeking a visa who does not have to admit additional information. Is that correct? Well, I, 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 I don't, I haven't, I, I'm familiar with, with all the individuals. I'm not sure that he's the only one that, that is at that position, but well, let, let uh, he is, it. it's correct that he's in the queue and he's waiting for his interview to be scheduled. All right. Will an interview be scheduled during the course of Executive Order 2's 90-day ban? I, I can't say that because sometimes interviews take longer than three months to happen. To schedule. I didn't say it take place. Uh, it, 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 depends on the, it depends on the waiting time, I think, for each, individual, um, for each individual person and for the place where they're going to do the interview. Uh, this individual has a priority date of April 14, 2015. Uh, I'm not th so that means that when that priority date comes up, I think he's allowed to, um, uh, to seek an interview. Uh, but I don't know where that date is uh, in the queue, if that's, if that's close or if they're still maybe back in early 2015 or into 2014 in terms of dates that are coming up. What I, what I can say to the court is that based on my understanding of the state's guidance so far that the process will continue as scheduled, that there won't be stopping interviews or significant delays in that process. Okay. Um, plaintiffs also raised the notion of future economic injuries causing them irreparable harm. Do you recall that that occurred in one of the filings, I think, fairly recently? Are you familiar with that argument? Well, I, it, it sounds to me like I, I'm not sure that that's it's unspe awfully speculative to me in terms of an actual, whether it's an actual concrete well, I just injury. want to know if, you, if you're familiar with it before I start asking you questions about it. Um, the, the idea that, that there'll be extra process they have to go through that will cost them uh, additional money? It, it's, uh, you know, Individuals? whether to spend substantial amounts of money going into great debt to make arrangements to travel to third countries, all for these interviews. Yeah, yes, Your Honor. All right. Um, how are those alleged economic harms impacted by the e Executive Order 2.0? Well, I, I don't think that they are. One, I mean, first of all, they're awfully speculative. Uh, they don't know when interviews will be. Um, two, the, 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 the result of travel is not because of the executive order. The result for travel is because most of the consular offices in the affected countries are closed. Uh, 
as we don't have embassies in those countries currently. So many of these individuals are required to travel to other countries. Um, some of the more popular countries that they would travel to do have long queues as a result. So there's quite a bit of uncertainty in this process in terms of where and when the interview will actually take place. So I, I, again, I, th I think these are, are very speculative harms uh, and, I, and I, I don't think there's a direct impact from the executive order on, on, on the uh, uncertain aspect of the visa application and interview process. It, it took a while, but we finally got to common ground there on, on the question I was asking. Uh, I'm going to ask you to sit down. Uh, Mr. Adams, you get 10 minutes. And you don't get rebuttal, so make your best, take your best shot. Thank you. If, if I may addr address a couple of points that have just been made by opposing counsel. That's what I would hope you'd do. Um, he said, and I, I believe I'm quoting him accurately, the visa process is one ask, ask the visa process, the visa issuance process is one aspect of the entry process. And again, that's that's consistent what we have said um, before when, when you noted that I was conflating entry and visa issuance. And, and I think the reason that happens is because the executive order itself completes the processes. And I think the key provision here that demonstrates that is in Section 3C of the executive order, and that's dealing with waivers. There it says, um, Notwithstanding the suspension of entry pursuant to Section 2 of this order, a consular officer or, as appropriate, the commissioner... Yes, sir, you've got to slow down. Sorry. We have really competent people yes. taking down a record, but they're not going to keep up with you speed reading. Understood. I'm, I'm going to skip down to halfway through instead of reading over fast. May decide on a case-by-case -case basis to authorize the issuance of a visa to or to permit the entry of a foreign national for whom entry is otherwise suspended if the foreign national has demonstrated to the officer's satisfaction that denying entry during the suspension period would cause undue hardship and that his or her entry would not pose a threat to national security and would be in the national interest. So there is the waiver. That's the waiver provision. And it is in, it is laid out in the process of issuing a visa. So the executive order uh, explicitly wraps in the, the waiver with the issuance of the visa. Someone does not go through this process and get a visa and then simply be denied entry. And this was consistent, again, with opposing counsel's statement. The executive order is covering that. Now, the very, the very document that he cited, the Department of State instructions that were released on Monday, said, quote, they do not plan to cancel any previously scheduled interviews, end quotes. So those people who already have interviews, like Mr. Omar's children, got their interviews. But implicit in that is that those who do not yet have their interviews aren't going to get them. Well, why, do you, why do you think that? If that were not the case, why would they limit it to just those who've been previously scheduled? Well, well because they haven't scheduled anyone else yet. That doesn't mean they're not going to do it. It just says they, they haven't done it yet. I mean, I, I, one of the things I think you've conceded in your briefing is that uh, applicants have a very limited ability to bring claims demanding things to happen. That, that discretion is largely vested in the counselor service and in the administration through the State Department. Um, so I'm not sure I understand your argument. My, my principal, my primary argument is that the executive order um, explicitly conflates the visa issuance process with its order suspending entry of the individuals, stating that they will only be issued a visa if they are uh, granted a waiver during the visa issuance process. So that when they talk about, oh, there's a waiver, so no one's really subject to this harm because they can overcome it, that waiver occurs in the visa issuance process. So it's not just focused on the physical entry at the airport. The government might this time be avoiding the spectacle of families being separated at airports or being turned around, but that does in no way counter the, the very real fact that these families are going to face indefinite suspension. The government likes to call it a, a temporary pause. Well, this is a, a temporary pause with no end in sight. It's indefinite suspension. Countries like Syria, Yemen, and Iran have no practical ability 
to complete the steps that the executive has laid out in his order to reestablish the processing of their cases. And so absent that, this indefinite ses is, um, suspension will continue. Well, let, let me, I'm, it's dangerous to reason by analogy here, but let, let me try. Let's assume we have country A, and country A has no citizenship or birth documentation system. With or without a 90-day pause, the, it, the United States government determines that it is not going to admit people from an area that has sponsored terrorism unless we can have documentary proof of citizenship or birth or whatever. That, in your mind, would be improper or permissible? If they made that decision based upon the country, it would be improper. And in fact, your hypothetical is no hypothetical. That is, that is the case sample of Somalia that for years has not had a functioning government. Now they have a functioning government that rules parts of the country. But even on the department's own website, it says it's not able to issue uh, uh, government documents. And so they, the individuals from Somalia already have to go through this belabored process to gather the evidence. And that's why many of them are imposed with additional requirements, such as DNA tests. But you've fallen into my trap, which, you, which I attempted to set for you, mm -hmm. w w which was that it's, it's not the fact that they're from a particular country. It's the fact that they can't satisfy a very specific provision about ability to show who they are. And, and that's generally accepted as, as a, a power that's given in the immigration system. But they're, they're, they are required to comply with the same obligations that every other individual is required to comply with. And so we represent on a daily basis individuals from Somalia who make it through these hurdles. Yes, it, it's harder for them, but they still have that opportunity. But now the president's order saying, you are indefinitely suspended. You no longer have this opportunity. And the government seeks to minimize that and saying, well, they can apply for a waiver. That it's only them and the individuals from these five other countries who now have this additional burden of applying for this waiver. And again, we have this ambiguous waiver that doesn't define when it will be issued. It doesn't define who's going to make the final decision. In fact, it doesn't even say what form must be filed what additional evidence must be given. It's just this theoretical burden that they must bear to show that they, it's in, in our country's national interest for them to be admitted and that they must prove the, the, the negative, that they don't present a national security threat. And I think in the government's response brief, they, they said, well, how can, how can defend, uh, rather plaintiffs say that that's an arduous waiver when it hasn't happened? Well, true enough, it, there's no cases yet, um, but I can tell you in over almost two decades of practicing immigration law, I've, I've yet to see an immigration waiver that's not arduous. And especially in situations like this where the criteria aren't defined and what criteria are defined place an almost insurmountable burden on the individuals with an ultimate discretionary determination. So that is a very concrete, real burden that our plaintiffs bear that plaintiffs from any other country do not have to overcome. And so to say that just because there's a chance at the end of the day at the end of however many months, they might make it through that process that there is no harm. I, I, I beg to differ, and I think there is imminent harm as this process is set to kick off tomorrow. And again, trying to minimize the, the fact that, oh, well, they've already spent a lot of time apart. What's a few more months? Well, for Ms. Ali and her seven-year-old child, every day represents irreparable harm. For, for Ms. Daman and her 16-year-old boy who's in war-torn Syria, every day presents psychological, emotional harm. And, and, and we hope not physical harm. We hope it doesn't come to that. But of course, that's what their, their fears are about. Um, again, the government repeatedly says, oh, many presidents have done this. And yet they're all over the map with their examples. They're focusing on processes that have nothing to do with immigrant visas. The visa waiver program is not an immigrant visa. That is a waiver of the non-immigrant visa, the temporary waiver program where an individual can come and visit. So yes, there are other parts of the immigration law that allow individuals to be discriminated on on the basis of um, their country. 
to make distinctions between countries, but not an immigrant visa process. And that is because our country has already gone through too much and suffered too much in what we've imposed on, on individuals because of their race and national origin to ever allow that to occur again. And, and again, these are our statutory limitations. We've also argued that there are constitutional limitations. And the government said, well, what might have occurred before? Let's look at this order. And they want us to forget all the prior order, the statements that were made in the campaign, the statements made after the campaign. But the Ninth Circuit has already clarified that those indeed reflect upon this process. I think uh, Justice Souter said it best in McCreary that not every just because it's a new morning doesn't make it a brand new world. They still have to deal with the consequences of their prior actions and their prior statements. And they're able to demonstrate that at a minimum, for purposes of a temporary restraining order, that they presented substantive legal issues that go to the merits. And given that they're able to demonstrate irreparable harm, the public interest uh, is in favors uh, the maintenance of a, a constitutional process it requires that our president abide by the laws. I think, again, what's most striking is the government is coming here and saying there should be no review for what the president does in this process, that it's outside the purvey of the courts. Well, fortunately, the Ninth Circuit has already rejected that argument, but even prior to this, case law is clear, even in individual consular determinations. So they talk about the doctrine of uh, non-reviewability of consular determinations. That doesn't apply here where we're talking about an attack upon a whole scale uh, policy. But even in individual determinations, this court has recognized constitutional interests of the spouse that's able to determine at a minimum in those individual cases of a denial whether there was a bona fide and facially legitimate um, basis for that. Here, we're not looking at an individual denial. We're challenging a, a legal policy of the president that we assert violates both the Immigration Nationality Act and the Constitution, and we believe that our, uh, we have provided the court with ample evidence of the irreparable harm, and the court is now in a position to preserve the status quo. And ultimately, this is the, the, the classical uh, request for a temporary restraining order, to preserve the status quo while we litigate the merits of the issues in order to avoid irreparable harm in the meantime. And on behalf of plaintiffs, and others similarly situated, we would request the court to enter that order. Thank you. Mr. Riedler. Your Honor, I would just make three brief points, unless you have any additional questions. Uh, the, f the first this is to return. This is your chance to speak. I'm doing my best to, to listen for a change. Uh, I, then I'll, I'll return to our, our initial discussion about uh, 1152, and I will point the court to uh, cases at page uh, 29 of our brief, uh, and I think there are cases in other sections of our brief that make clear that, uh, just to quote one of them, there's little question that the executive has the power to draw distinctions among aliens on the basis of nationality. I think that's been quite well settled in the cases, and again, I don't think my friends on the other side have presented a contrary case. Um, second, with, her point to, with respect to the question you asked about 11A5 and whether that was in our brief, that's at page 15, uh, and, it, and it indicates that uh, Section 1985 was amended in 1978, which was after the amendments to 1152 that came in 1965. And three, I was just going to respond briefly to my, my friend's point about well, before you leave page 29, how many of your cases deal with the issuance of, of visas? Uh, on, on, th on that page... Um, I know that sounds like a law school class. <laughs> uh, I mean, you, you cite Gene versus Nelson, um, Najiki, N-A-R-E-N-J-I, and I, I, Rahaj. Uh, how many of them deal with the question of... Um, Issuance of an immigrant visa versus other aspects of the immigration system. Uh, I, I don't know that I don't know that any of them do. Uh, they make the broader they make the broader point that there's no national distinctions. A fair point, Your Honor. Uh, we also cite the Abrazic case from the D.C. Circuit in our in our brief, which I know is in the immigration context. Talked about the president's sweeping power under 212F. Um, so I think the case law is on our side on on that point. 
And the last point I was just going to make was a factual one. My friend was asking about sort of the uncertainties in the process and specifically who's going to decide the waiver question. And again, I think that's clear from the State Department guidance that says a counselor officer will carefully review each case to determine whether the applicant is affected by the executive order and if so, whether the applicant qualifies. And the qualifies references back to the waiver exemption indicated in the prior sentence. So uh, for those reasons, unless Your Honor has any questions, we would strongly urge you to deny emergency relief uh, in this case at this point. All right. Counsel, as you can recognize from where I've attempted to guide this discussion this afternoon, the issues that are of utmost interest to the court are the Immigration and Naturalization Act questions uh, and the question of irreparable harm. Um, that's not one that I want to rush into uh, on the basis of having heard you. Um, I want a chance to uh, to look at the record and I have my notes of what you said. So uh, we will be issuing an order. It will not be an oral opinion from the bench. Mr. Adams, anything further? No, thank you. All right. Mr. Radler? No, thank you, Your Honor. All right. Then we'll be in recess. Thank you.